Ladies and gentlemen, today on the program, an apology of sorts to fans of Liverpool Football Club. Maybe not an apology, but an example of due diligence. And you're going to understand what I mean when you listen to this Rotisode. It's Rotisode time with my good buddy, Ken the Zen. Now, there's a point in the following conversation where I get into a bit of a diatribe about American ownership of English Premier League football clubs and why that has generally been an exercise in frustration for fans of those clubs and why it has not generally worked very well. And I cite the example of American owners led by George Gillette owning Liverpool in the uh, early part of the 2000s and what a disaster that was and how it almost destroyed one of the most storied, revered, followed and worshipped sports franchises. I'm reluctant to use the word franchises. In the entire world, kids. And here's the deal. I don't follow Liverpool, so I don't pay a lot of attention to their details. All right? I appreciate Liverpool in as much as they defeat Tottenham Hotspur, which, as an Arsenal fan, always warms the cockles. But uh, I don't pay all that much attention to Liverpool because, you know, Apart from beating Spurs, why would you? But in attacking George Gillette, who, by the way, kids, was also at one point the owner of my beloved Montreal Canadiens, so these guys keep getting around, you know? Gillette nearly destroyed Liverpool, but he had an accomplice, and that accomplice's name was Tom Hicks, and the two of them together, Hicks and Gillette, made a disaster of Liverpool, and fans of Manchester United will have their own opinion about American ownership of their team. Certainly Arsenal fans do of ours, and uh, it's been a frustration. But I let Tom Hicks off the hook because I forgot he existed, and uh, hey, you know, that's, that's to my benefit, right? So it was Hicks and Gillette, not Gillette alone, and it was not the Gillette family that destroyed Liverpool, or very nearly. It was Hicks and Gillette together. So. I want to put that out there now because I know a lot of Liverpool fans listen to this show the world over in their millions, and I don't want them getting upset that I got the story wrong on how Americans nearly destroyed their team, okay? So it was Hicks and Gillette. If you're looking to tar and feather anybody, those are your guys and have fun with that. Having cleared that up, yes, it's Rotisode time once again, and Rotisodes happen when... When your humble host is on the road, as I have been, cruising around parts of Texas with the Sarah Smith Band and my good buddy Ken the Zen, and as ever, we took the opportunity on a down night to get a bottle of wine, which turned out to be one that we both loved and uh, rank very, very highly on our list of wines consumed on the podcast. If you ever watch what used to be Top Gear uh, and uh, is now The Grand Tour on Amazon Prime, the the three hosts of that show, and I'm going to talk about that show on a subsequent solo episode, but uh, it's a car show and whatever, and they have a track and they race different extremely exotic, expensive, and vaguely stupid cars around that track, and they have a listing of which cars went the fastest, and so it's fun to watch the leaderboard. I'm thinking Rotisodes should have a wine board. What ranks highest on our list of chosen wines that we've sampled for these Rotisodes, of which there have now been six. And we've had some really good wines, and the one we did to, on this episode may challenge for the title. In fact, Ken the Zen thinks it's number one. I'm not going to tell you what it is, 
It's straight up on the other side of the intro, and you can hear about it and decide for yourself if you try to sample it. Anyways, Rotisode, Ken the Zen, Texas. Uh, we're having a great time. We have had a great time. And, uh, man, always great to sit down and talk to my buddy Ken about music and sports and life and whatever happens to come up along the way, you know. We do not script these at all. I don't come in with questions. We just pour the wine and start talking. And these are some of my favorite episodes because they just feel like home. And I hope when you listen, they feel like home to you too. Comforting and warm and fun and funny and insightful, hopefully. This one I think will prove no different. Please do enjoy it. Our dear, dear friend Denny Goche is not with us, but that don't mean he can't help us out. Hey, Denny boy! Roll intro! You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Ken the Zen. Hello, gentle listeners. Aloha. And gentle John. Both what do we you. say in this region? Is there like a... Uh... Get her done. Get her done. Get her done. I, I, I want to go goo, 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 but I think that was uh, actually uh, South Carolina. Was it? Or Has- North Carolina. Hazard County? I believe I so. I feel like it was Georgia. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. But it was it was definitely not Texas, which is where we are at this moment. I have moment. been told it was the Carolinas. I believe you. By by someone who is Dukes of Hazard crazy. There is such a person? There is, yeah. Really? Yeah. Even drove down there to check out a Cooter's Garage, actually. That's a thing? That is a real thing, yeah. Not so much a garage, but a uh, like a tourist location, but called Cooter's Garage. Can you buy... Daisy Duke short shorts in such a place? You can buy absolutely anything you want anywhere. Amazon Prime. Yes, you can. Yeah. Uh, in Japan, you can get stuff like that in vending machines. Get out of here. I know in Europe, you can get some pretty interesting things in the uh, men's bathroom as well. I seem to remember. <laughs> I'm too embarrassed to say. I, I, I know it started with a, a P. Usi and then went into something else that I, I just got stopped there. Because if you're stopped at a truck stop, okay. you may need some of these things. You know, when in Rome, you do what Romans do. When in Germany, you do what Germans do, what do I suppose. What do Germans do? Um, I feel like that's a dark I, I don't know because I'm not one. I'm not one either, although no. I have the heritage. I think I might too, but I have to um, maybe get that test done and figure that out. So if I do like a past life regression, maybe it'll take me back to Germany and I can tell you what Germans do. That'd be fantastic. Well, I think by now we would know what Germans do, but we don't. No. Different Germans we see, maybe. We see different Germans. They do the same things that we do. Oh. <laughs> For the most part, don't they? Then they are so, wrong. Yeah, so very dark people indeed. <laughs> yes. Speaking of dark, oh, yeah. see that? See what I did there? Yeah, you were really good. Uh, as is the tradition, we have a bottle of wine to sample on this Rotisode. And what I have today is the Apothic Dark Red Blend. So Apothic is the company. They have really cool gothic-looking labels. This is a California red wine, 2017 going to read what it says on the back. You yes, ready for this, Ken? Please, I don't know if I'm ready, but I'm excited. There's a romance in darkness. It draws our curiosity and beckons a desire to taste the unknown. Apothic Dark blends dark fruit flavors of blueberry and blackberry with opulent notes of coffee and dark chocolate for a rich yet silky smooth wine experience. Well, that sounds amazing. Nothing for says sure. nothing says darkness like blueberries, man. And chocolat. And chocolat. Yes. Meine Schokoladenseite. And uh, you mentioned something there at the end. I have terrible short-term memory. What was the uh, the last sentence? It said, technically speaking, the last sentence is a paragraph. Apothic dark blends dark fruit flavors of blueberry and blackberry with opulent notes of coffee and dark chocolate for a rich 
yet silky smooth wine experience. Right. So the joke that was going through my head was, is very similar to me, except for I'm poor and silky smooth. And you are anything but dark. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> You're white chocolate, man. Well, I'm, I'm the yin to that yang. Perhaps. Indeed you are. You are you are apothic light. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I feel it as we sample this wine, it's only right and fair that we toast Denny Gauthier, who is not with us on this trip. So cheers to Denny. Cheers to Denny. And to Ken the Zen. I miss you, Denny. We miss Denny boy. Here we go. Ken's giving you the full experience. Ooh. That's in honor of Denny. Um, yeah, so there's a nice hints of blackberries and, um, and chocolate, I believe, in that. No, it's delicious. I'm feeling so much darkness. It actually is quite good. It's really good. It's uh, what I would call a robust wine. I'd be so bold to say that if Apothic was listening right now, they could just send us a case of that and we would promote them every Rotisode. We really would, you know. I feel like Apothic should sponsor rotisodes. I think so too. Cuz we like that wine. Mm. We like that label. It's it's really rich. Holy cow. Yeah. Whew. We're just sitting in silence. <laughs> yeah, right? I was just I, I it was hard not to make a dick joke with the rich, but <laughs> but I did anyways. I don't even know what you would say, but that's what makes you Ken the Zen. Uh. Like it's a thick, it's a thick dark wine. That's really good. It I'm not going to lie, that may be my favorite we've had on the Rotisode. Really? I think so. If I remember the other Rotisodes, I'm very which I impressed. maybe do. Uh, we have to listen to them. <laughs> You've listened yeah. to some of them. I do listen to them. Did you listen to the Fort Erie one, the last one we did, the Christmas one? Was that the last one? That was with Danny. Yeah. Jeez, I don't know. I don't know. I'm on. Um, I just finished. Uh, Bon. Oh, Nikki. Nikki, Nikki Bond, Nikki, Nikki Bond. Bond, yes, of course, yeah, which is right. great. So I'm there at about 22, I think. No, it's more than that. Oh, good. Yeah, I don't know. It's 30s. It's like 30s. Late, late late 20s. Okay, Nikki. Anyways, the wine we had that night was really good too. But I can't remember what it was. Right. It was the expensive bottle I bought, the Spanish right, bottle. Right, it was. That was good. That one. Uh, I like this one more. Do you? It's, it's this one smoother. I find apothic. Do you hear us talking about you? Dark after dark, apothic after dark. style. In Texas. Yeah. A Yeehaw! Yeehaw! A California wine in Texas, which is where we are because oh, we're on yeah. the road, as usual, That's thus great. the road is sowed. So, there's a couple things we've got to talk about right away, right off the bat. All right, let's get into this. Ken is in today, after much trial and travail, you scored tickets to two Pearl Jam concerts. Oh, my word. Yes, I did. Um, so Pearl Jam is on tour again. And uh, luckily for me, I did the Ticketmaster Verified Fan, and I got accepted for two of the shows of the three that I wanted. And um, this morning was the uh, the hustle to get those tickets into my inbox. With hotel Wi-Fi. With hotel Wi-Fi, cutting in and out. And luckily, uh, my good friend John helped me out with some some data, which was fantastic. I'm good for a hotspot. Yeah, that's his nickname, actually. Hotspot. Hotspot. Yeah. Johnny Hotspot, they call me. J A H S. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your your history with Pearl Jam. Well, Pearl, Pearl, maybe I've talked about this before, but the history of Pearl Jam for me is in the nineties, I did not like them when really? they were super popular. I really? was uh I was into that Seattle scene, but I was more into Alice in Chains and Nirvana Soundgarden. Um, a little bit more of the heavier things. I always thought Pearl Jam was just kind of like a Classic rock band, really, you know, but thrown into that. I was never into it. And then when I met uh, the mother of my daughter, mm -hmm. I would go hang out at her apartment and uh, I'd get to pick the music and it was all stuff I am not into at all. Amanda Marshall and that kind of stuff. And um, the only, I know, I know, but the only uh, good CD they had was, uh, <laughs> or she had, was Pearl Jam Yield. <laughs> <laughs> so I listened to it every time. And then I became a Pearl Jam fan and I got to see them live the very first time. And like I said, not in the 90s. It was uh, October 5th, 2000 in Toronto. And uh, one of my favorite bands, Supergrass, was opening. And then after that, boom, shaka, boom, boom. Uh-oh. Baby Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> Pearl yeah. Jam is responsible? 
Pearl Jam is responsible. And when they came to London a few years ago, uh, both myself and Sydney's mom waited outside hoping to get Eddie Vedder's autograph and whatnot. And uh, I met three of the band, but I had to go eat dinner. So I left and she got to meet Eddie Vedder and got to tell him that story, which Dude, is pretty awesome. How yeah. many stories do you have whereby the people you were with met the people and you disappeared or it's, missed I it know. somehow? It's, it's just, you know, universally, that must say something. I'm this close. You're the reverse pokeroo. Maybe. What would that be? Pokeroo. Yeah, I don't know how you would say that Rook backwards. Op. So you met the other guys in the yeah, band. Yeah, I, I met uh, Stone Gossard. Yeah. He was kind of a standoffish, we'll was say. He? And then I got to meet uh, Boom Casper. Boom. Which was awesome. He was kind of hidden away. He didn't come out when the other where the other guys came out, and I saw him smoking. And since I am a fam, I know who that is. So right. I went and I uh, checked him. I was like, boom. And he was like, shh. Come oh, here. really? So I came over, and uh, uh, he had a cigarette, and we talked for a little while, which was great. And wow. then I went back to the behind the arena where the band was coming out and I got to meet Mike McCready and got my picture with him. That's right. Which was great. Yeah. So was Jeff Ament around at that point? He was. I just, they came you out later. Him? Yeah. He was the last one to come out actually. Yeah. Eddie Vedder and then Jeff Ament. Well, I'm very impressed. Thank you. I, I was too. You I remember the date of that specifically? Oh, I do because it's very important to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my daughter and all, I love her so much. And also because Pearl Jam is one of those bands that sells concert or uh, bootlegs of all the shows. Right. So the very first show I went to, I was able to buy the CD of that show. So I know the date That's all awesome. the time from the cover. Yeah. And it's my birthday, October 7th. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Interestingly enough, the first time I saw King's X live, which was long after the glory days, believe it or not, it was early 2000s. Uh, I found a bootleg of that show on the LimeWire. Remember oh, LimeWire? <clears throat> I love, sorry, I love Weimar. Yeah. I do. Yeah, I did. Until, so, until all the viruses and stuff. Well, yeah, that did not help. Yeah. But so I saw them in, in Toronto at some club. I don't remember which one. And uh, yeah, like the next day or week or whatever, I just was sifting LimeWire for live King's X bootlegs in Toronto, 2001, yeah. whatever it was, came up. And that's a cool thing when you can hear yourself screaming in the audio. It's true. It is true. I, I always listen. I've I've been to uh, eleven Pearl Jam shows and twelve and thirteen coming up, and I have a bunch of them on on bootlegs. And I'm always listening. Like, hey, is that me? Is that me? But there's no way I'm pretty quiet. It's got it. Well, plus Pearl Jam show is thousands of people. <clears throat> King's X show is hundreds, maybe less. That's, that's in, true in Canada. But I will say this: uh, with those bootlegs. Um, after they stopped doing the CDs and it was just MP3s, you could get the bootlegs. Yeah, uh, they would send pictures, professional pictures of the show. Oh, nice! With the MP3s for ten bucks. And uh, there's a picture. I'm in one of the pictures that they sent out. Are you really? Yeah, because the last song they did in London in 2006 was uh, "Rocking in the Free World." So mm -hmm. they they flipped the lights on, and it was a side shot of the stage, and I was right there. So oh, there's wow. me and and my lady friend and. Eddie Vedder and the rest of the boys. That's amazing. All in the same shot, yeah. Oh, wow. Sent to everybody that bought that. That's pretty cool. If you uh, want to find me, I'm the guy wearing the Pittsburgh Steelers jersey, number 92. Yes. Of course you are. Yes. Who, was, who was number 92? That was Harrison, uh, who I loved. That could, one of the best linebackers ever until he went to the Patriots. Yeah, and then he, his game fell apart. And those jerseys burn pretty good. Yeah, so, they do. Yeah, which was nice. My favorite Pittsburgh Steelers of recent memory, and I have a couple or Troy Palomalu. Oh yeah. And Heinz Ward. Yeah. The receiver. Heinz Ward was always smiling. I like that about Heinz Ward. He was Ward. awesome. Right? Yep. And uh do they have Jerome Bettis? They did? Yeah. Of course. For Bettis, I remember. Yep. So I'm up on my yep. Steelers. For the two thousand six Super Bowl, all yeah. three of those players run that you mentioned. Right. Yeah. And then two thousand eight Jerome Bettis had retired, but the other guys were there. Well, but Palomalu, I believe will be in the Hall of Fame this year. Oh, is he a good elected I believe so. I believe so. He was amazing. Yeah, I and, think there's two Steelers. And what hair he had. And what head and shoulders commercials oh, he made. Oh, what head and shoulders commercials I mean, he made. it was the most entertaining thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. We're, Although I have straight hair, so I couldn't relate. But Well, your hair is something of a marvel. It's silky smooth. It is. It's, it's quite astonishing. Yeah, thank you. Because my hair is all wiry and kinky. Yeah. My hair's a real pain. Yours was meant to be worn long. 
Mine was not. <laughs> and yet here we are. And yet here we are. <laughs> well, some of it is long in your head. Yeah, it's getting there. It's getting. There. It's down to my ears. Yeah, it's getting back. Yeah. It's like it's slipping into Kurt Cobain territory. It's, it's, it's there. It's on its way. Almost. Almost there. I never, I, I'm suspecting by November it'll be exactly where it needs to be. Maybe by the time Europe in the fall comes around, mm. if that comes around. That's exactly right. That's what I'm thinking yeah, in my mind, in my hair. So I was never a Pearl Jam fan. Yeah. Uh, I respect the band, and I certainly like how they look after their fans. Yeah. And I even like some of the songs now, but Pearl Jam was after my time. So right. Pearl Jam was actually on the fault line. So when I was in my first year of school, it would be 92. Right. Yeah, there it is. So the 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 first Pearl Jam record was out. Yeah. And people were beginning to listen to it. And so we had like a tug of war on the radio. And I was in Windsor and we listened to Z-Rock out of Detroit. Okay. And they would play a Jackal song. Mm-hmm. I Stand Alone, When Will It Rain. That That's me. Right. Jackal's me. Right. And then they'd play a Pearl Jam song. And they'd play sex type thing, yeah. By by uh, Stone Temple Pilots, which I loved, yeah, because they were a heavy band. They're great at that point in time, yeah. And I think they changed a little bit. They're very diverse. All yeah. their all their records have some really heavy numbers, I guess. And then they're, they're very diverse, which is good. But Pearl like Jam that. was the new wave of rock music, and uh, I was very definitely in the preceding wave of rock music. <laughs> right. So it was a fault line, my music and the new music. And I never really got into them, but I like Pearl Jam well enough. And I know they're big King's X fans. And in fact, right. Doug Panic from King's X did a record with Jeff Ament. And the band was called Tress Mountains. And so, you know, there's a connection there. I love that. I respect it. That's kind of one of the cool things about uh, Pearl Jam as well, is that all of them are in other projects. Right. And they all have lots of bands and they're always making music. And um, I really love that. They never stop. Right. Never, whether it's as a unit or individual, all one of them is always playing. So now they've just dropped a new single. They did. Uh, the Dance of the Clairvoyance. There's already covers really? on YouTube. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. So oh, wow. I saw like a news <laughs> article that said there are already there's already a cover of this song available on YouTube. Of course. Well, that's... You know, some some people's job is to pick whatever comes out right now, yeah. and what you do is you make a cover of it, yeah. because everybody's checking YouTube and whatnot mm. to hear the new song, so you're going to be right in there in the top listings, always. It's kind of a, a thing to do if that's what you want to do for attention. That's a cynical thing to do. Yeah. No, it, but no? it's but it's true. No, it's like I've been told, you know, how to make it as a musician online. Right. That is definitely one of the things to do. Whatever song comes out that week, do a cover of it right away, and you'll get way more hits than you will of an older song. It does make a certain amount of sense. Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't done it, but it's interesting. Well, maybe we need to start doing it. Maybe maybe I will. Maybe I will, too. Maybe we will. Maybe we will. Like What's it. your take on the new Pearl Jam single, Ken the Zen, as a fan? Um, I really, I love it. Uh, I liked how it started. You know, it's got a kind of like a dance beat, and it's um, very Killers-esque which uh, I really appreciate that band, The Killers, as well. For sure. Um, so I'm I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it. I've yeah. heard it probably ten times now, and uh, every time it just gets a little bit, a little yeah. bit better and better. I so love it. they're dropping a whole new record, right? Yeah, they have a new record. I do not work for Pearl Jam, but they do have. Maybe I will. <laughs> maybe guys, guys, hey guys, guys. Um, I know how to tune basses, and. Uh, they have a new record coming out in March, and it is called Gigaton. Gigaton. Which, you know, I have no doubt is a pun that they play a lot. They do. I mean, they gigaton. Yeah, they gigaton. But they made it one word, which is pretty cool. Is it likely, are their records uh, diverse in terms of style and, and tone, or do they tend to be consistent in terms of style and tone? Well, they've been around since 92, right? Yeah. I, th- I believe this is their 11th record. Yeah. So they certainly change as as they get older. Um, Are the albums themselves? They they kind of Pearl Jam is one of those uh, bands which I like because all the members write, so you get all the different right. kind of genres together, yeah. and they really work together as a unit. So they are pretty diverse. You can get some really heavier numbers, and then alt country even sometimes, right. and pop. This new song's kind of like pop, pop rock. They do it all. I love it. Ukulele, Eddie Vedder, love it. 
Ken the Zen. Ten, two thumbs up to Pearl Jam and their new Yay. single. PJ, I'm glad they're back. It's been seven years. So Has it really? Seven years since their last record. Lightning Bolt, which I love. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of got like a bluesy rock overtone. But then, like I said, they have punk songs on there too and everything. Love songs, all that kind of stuff. The new King's X record will be the first in 12 years-ish. Yeah, like Is it this year? Yeah, that's what they say. All right. Yeah. I, I fear it may be the last one. Don't be afraid. You never know. Unless you know something I don't. If they take 12 years to do another one, it certainly will be the last one. Well, a lot of bands do that. Like Tool. Yeah. And I have no doubt that's not their last record. It's just sometimes life happens. And, you know, you don't have to be part of the machine once you're making your own decisions. My reservation is that Doug Pinnock turned 70 this year. <laughs> so a record at 82 is I suppose possible. I don't know if you've heard the latest Alice Cooper record, but it kicks ass. <laughs> he's only, he's not 80 though. Well, <laughs> 80's not 72 either. No, it's not. You know, and Paul McCartney's brand new record. True. Chaos Station, which we listened to in Europe. Yeah. That's pretty kick ass too. And he's. It is a good record. He's still young enough to grow a beard, which is great. <laughs> well, I, I certainly hope that this is the dawn of a late golden age for the band and that they sorry my microphone's falling apart that they release a, a few records will be ter super terrific they've had some health issues going on yeah. it's it's been an interesting ride but we're talking about pearl jam not king's x well we're talking about great music that we we're love. talking about great music and that's that we okay love. and i hope this album kicks ass for you i really do well and hopefully not to last. Who knows? They, Nobody wants to be the last of anything unless it's a planned last. Right. They have not released anything. They've had, had like a couple of in-studio clips, like 20 or 30 seconds long, and you're not even hearing the track. You're hearing it being played through the studio speakers, and they're listening uh, back. So it's like a second, like you're getting a speaker, a recording of a recording yeah, kind yeah. of thing. But what I've heard sounds really great. So It's really exciting to get it in a non- usual fashion too though I guess. to hear it differently because then when you get to have the real one it makes a big difference to be like wow this is even better than that which is which is great because it actually sounds like something right yeah yeah sure. all right so we need to talk about pearl jam we also need to talk about the xfl the king's xfl perhaps the king's xfl yeah, oh, can i bring good. that in very good kendis then <laughs> so the king's xfl when the reason why we can call it that is because one of the six teams or eight teams is Houston, which yeah. is the birthplace of Kings X, that's, if, that's, if I've been told correctly well, from my friend. That's certainly the um, headquarters for the glory years. Okay. The band started in Springfield, Missouri oh. in like 1980 or something like okay, that. Okay. And then moved to Houston just before becoming Kings X and landing a record right. deal. Right. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Yes, but yeah, Houston was where it was all based, and they used to perform behind a big Texas flag was their backdrop, right. and yeah. yeah. Um, and Houston has a team in the XFL. Now, we, we had this discussion <laughs> on the 30-hour drive to Texas. <laughs> yeah, the short ride. The short ride yeah. about uh, who our XFL teams would be. Yeah, how do you the, – the trick is, is how do you pick what your team's going to be when you have zero background knowledge. Yes. And myself, I'm colorblind, so right. looking at jerseys does no good for me. Right. So I have to go on names alone. So we, we've got to, we, we sat down, we educated ourselves. We did. We picked out the eight teams and we went through them and we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to pick out a winner and I believe uh, well, I've got my winner already. Well, we've decided at least in a pre preliminary way the Dallas is Ken the Zen's team. I know, I'm which is wrong their as a Steelers. Again. It's wrong for a Steelers. It is. The, but Dallas Renegades. But the Renegades. I hope they play that stick song as their intro. Renegade, which is killer. <laughs> and they have, uh, who's the quarterback guy they've they got? They have Landry Jones. Landry Jones. Who's the backup in, in Pittsburgh, of course, which so there's is, a, there's a connection. That's, that's my in right there. Otherwise, even though I am in the great state of Texas, I would not pick a Dallas team. So much as I am a Steelers fan. So, some people are listening to this and they're like, "What on earth are they even talking about?" Well, if you don't know, <laughs> '70s to 
uh, about 1996, there was a pretty big rivalry between Pittsburgh and Dallas. Yeah. As, and I throw San Fran in there, but they were the best teams ever in Plus, football. Dallas likes to present itself as America's team, the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, they, right? that they do. Yeah. And, and the Pittsburgh Steelers have their own claim to being America's team. Yeah, like all the Super Bowls. That's right. Yeah, you they, know they beat they've beaten Dallas plenty of times, and right. And I know that was a big deal back then. Uh, I'm not old enough to to have lived that, but yeah, man, I've certainly watched it on the television. Not as bad as a Leafs fan. I don't know anybody no. who was alive when they won anything. No, I, I, did they win anything? Uh, allegedly, I, I was not allowed to see it, and I am not a young man. I don't know. It's 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 hard to talk against the Leafs, but. They haven't won since there's more than six teams. Man. That's right. Come on. That's right. At least the Habs have done <laughs> like that. Like they would have taken the first year of the XFL maybe. Yeah. But then expansion, they're done. That was it. You've been able to see your team win the title. I've been able, to, yes, twice and lose once. Have you been able, you've been able to see your hockey team win too, right? I've been able, well, I used to be a Leafs fan <laughs> in the in the 80s. That's sad. I know. The well, Ballard years. Well, that's, you, you are what you grow up. Yes, you, you are. Know? That's why I'm a So it wasn't fan. until I was old enough to make my own decisions that I switched to Edmonton. So they had already won all their cups, um, but I did get to see them go in 2006 and lose in game seven. I remember it well. But the Steelers won the Super Bowl in 2006, so I was I was riding that high. It was okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've been lucky enough to see my team win the Stanley Cup twice, yeah. the Canadians, in 86 and 93. And they won a string of them in the 70s when I was alive, but not self-aware, mm. just before the Islanders dynasty happened mm. in the late 70s. And uh, the Canadians have not won a cup in a very long time and don't look like winning one anytime soon, unlike the Oilers. Don't give up. You never know. Anything is possible, but eek. You never know. The Oilers didn't even make the playoffs last year, so... Yeah, and they they probably should have, you know. <laughs> so the Habs are the Habs are in this weird position. For you European fans, the Habs are the Montreal Canadiens of the National Hockey League, the most decorated by a long, long way franchise in in the NHL. Right, but not for a long, long time. That's right. Um, they have a really good young team happening, but a bunch of older, expensive veterans too. And the balance is not super duper working, but yeah. the youth is starting to come up, but they don't look like winning it anytime soon. Well, I hope for you that they play Edmonton in the finals. Well, that would be good. That'd be awesome. That'd be fun for us, and we could yeah. road episode from those games. Yeah, we could we could take a two week friend break, and that would be awesome. <laughs> I think we watch the games together. It'd I think we would actually. I th yeah. It would be great. I'm not I'm not that uh, crazy about it. You know, like I love it, but. Now Pittsburgh against somebody else in football. Yeah, I can't be friends with. I, I, you know, I was good friends with somebody who was a Green Bay fan. Oh, so Pittsburgh played Green Bay in the Super Bowl a few years ago, and I decided to go to their house to watch oh, the game. You can't do that. And let's just say the it didn't work out well, and because I'm a bit of a dick, we might may even not be friends now. <laughs> Sports matters. Yeah, I. I'm a baby face, for sure. Dude, I went to a game in Montreal, Toronto at Montreal, and I sat in the cheap seats where Leaf fans sit. <laughs> and you know that I'm a not an aggressive person, and I was ready to murder somebody oh, yeah. in that game. And the, the Habs, I think they lost. They did, like 6-5. Yeah. It was one of those games. And a great game, just bad result. Great game, bad right. result. And these Leaf fans, and by the third oh, period, yeah, people course. are loaded, and it was, it was. I, I can never do it again. I can never do it again. That is tough, and I can I can understand. I've got to see Pittsburgh uh, Steelers play four times, and they're four zero. Yeah. So I haven't had that experience yet, but I know it wouldn't go over well if if they did lose it's, for sure. It's rough. There was one time I saw them play Buffalo, and it went into overtime. Buffalo came back and tied the game last seconds, and that was very uncomfortable yeah. in itself. Even yeah. though Pittsburgh won, it was, and I was in Buffalo, and luckily I got out alive. I uh, when I was a kid, though, one of my great childhood memories is that somehow my dad got tickets with some friends, and we went to Maple Leaf Gardens to see the Habs play the Leafs, yeah. and the Canadians beat the Leafs that night. Guy Lafleur scored on a slap shot from the blue line. Yeah. It was 
a pinnacle moment of my childhood. Yeah. So I got that on those. That's great. Le- memory to last you a lifetime. Yeah. Which is awesome. But and but I've been I I got a whole bunch of souvenirs, right? We went to like the souvenir stand and dad's like, oh, what would you like? And I'm, and I'm up there ordering a Habs puck and a Habs pennant and a Habs whatever <laughs> at Maple Leaf Gardens. Yeah. It was beautiful, man. Oh, that's great. I loved it. And uh, I've been lucky enough in the soccer world. But go ahead. Then. What are you going to say? No, I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything. In the, yeah. in the soccer world, I've been somewhat lucky lately in that I've seen Arsenal win the FA Cup three times recently. Yeah. which is the premier cup competition tournament. It's my favorite one. There you go. The FA. Yeah, the fuck up. Yep, the fuck up. It's named after me. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Arsenal win that three times lately, which is nice, even though they're having a dreadful season now. And I got to see Toronto FC win MLS Cup yeah. in 2017. Yeah, yay Toronto. And the Raptors too. And the Raptors they, won last year. They have year. a couple of winners there in yeah. their city. That's right. It's uh, and I got to see. Of course, we saw the Blue Jays win the World Series in ninety two yes. and ninety three. That was the, the first riot I was ever part of. Really? Yeah, I was downtown London for the first time they won in ninety two and then ninety three. Yeah. And yeah, I was just a young young boy, and uh, went downtown, and everybody's like jumping on cars and climbing up the street lights, and it was it was insane. I lasted about ten minutes. I had I had to get out of there. That was a big deal. That I, was a big deal. I can remember. I was working at the grocery store as a produce man, mm-hmm. as and I would have been ninety two. I was like nineteen, mm-hmm. and they would they had the games on in the store over the in the playoffs over oh. the over the intercom. Yeah, so they shut the music off. Oh, that's awesome. And plugged in the radio so people shopping could listen to the ball game. It was like a huge, yeah, yeah. at least a provincial thing, maybe even a national thing. I bet you it was a national cultural thing. No kind of like the Raptors. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, because it's all American teams. Right. And then one Canadian team. Right. Yeah. And then we won. And then yeah. Joe Carter hitting the home run in 93. Yeah. The World Series winner. Touch yeah. them all, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, it was a really good time for baseball. And then the strike happened. And then the strike happened. And, and then, then I've stopped following baseball the Yankees, since then. The Yankees That's and it. Red Sox decided to outspend everybody and just keep winning everything. And I was listening to Bill Burr's podcast, his most recent one today. He went on a huge diatribe about baseball. So there's a big scandal right now, right? Oh, the, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't follow baseball. So the Houston Astros won the World Series a couple of years ago. Okay. And... It's been discovered since that they were cheating and stealing sing, stealing signs from the other team. <laughs> what are they, Patriots? Right? <laughs> yeah. Now, this has been going on forever, but okay. they got sophisticated, whether it's like a camera and whatever. Right, yeah. And so people are, <laughs> are demanding that that World Series be rescinded <laughs> and yada, yada, yada. And Bill Burr went on this huge <laughs> diatribe about how baseball's always been crooked. Yeah, sure. It, it all is. It's all about finding the slightest advantage and then using that. That's, and it's that's like professional sports. The steroids, the cork bats, yeah. the, uh, you know, after... I, I remember the uh, Vaseline on the, on the oh, yeah. forearms. You know, be like the stuff all over the pitcher's jersey, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. mustard and yeah. whatever, like whatever they could put Gosh. on the ball, right? Oh, man, that's insane. But yeah, I've right? certainly seen it. Yeah. Wow. And so... Um, yeah, but I mean the the Blue Jays, apart from one little blip, haven't been worth watching since 1993. Right? Yeah, just that Batista bat flip. That that was a great moment. It was for you. It was a great moment, but for me, it was an embarrassing moment. Was it? Because I thought it was the most aggressive thing that I've ever seen. And in your face, take that, which I am not a part of, and I don't think that Canadian should be represented that way at all. Wow. Myself. Sen says nay, nay to the bat flip. Yeah, I really still dislike it, and I. I really disliked it, almost to hated it when it happened, and especially when people were getting off on it. I was like, "Oh, you're kind of really rubbing it in the other person's face," and oh, I don't like that. I don't know. I got. I was as caught up in the emotion as anybody else. I get it. I else. get it. I get it. But it had been a crazy just because game. I don't like baseball, maybe you know. So that's what really sticks a little bit more. But I don't know. I don't give a crap about baseball, but I do no. like baseball playoffs. Right. I really do. Mm-hmm. When the yeah, when I, the Jays are in it, which is almost never. Yeah, yeah. But I you know, know what? It's so long. I don't. Baseball for me is just. It's a great napper. Oh, I don't like it either. It's a great napper, and I don't see the know? point of game seventy four in a hundred and sixty two <laughs> game <laughs> right. schedule. Yeah. Who cares? Who yeah. goes to that and why? For me, that's not. Although people love baseball. People do love baseball. I've seen like 
sometimes stadiums have like 20 people in them. I know. So they love them. They love baseball. Oh, yeah. But it's like there's so many freaking games. That's what's great about the NFL. Yes, sir. Every game matters so much. And the XFL even more. How many games in the XFL? Well, there's only eight teams. And they don't, I think the season is only two months or three months. So, so how many games I don't know. There? Well, we play once a week. I'm well, going to guess see. there's... I'm going to bet... I don't even know, but I'm going to guess they play eight games. I can't. And then playoffs is I my can't guess. Look it up real quick. But I don't know. But it matters. And it's the same yeah. in the English Premier League. It's like you, it's every, the whole season is home and away against yeah. every other team. Yeah. It's 38 games. Yeah, I like that. It matters. Mm-hmm. Baseball, it's a thousand games. Who gives a crap? Mm-hmm. You know? That's right. Yeah. But we haven't talked about my pick in oh. the XFL. People oh, don't know yes. it. People may not understand what the XFL is. Okay. Okay. Well, I feel sorry for them because the ex- XFL just is massive for ex- me. Explain the XFL to so those the who XFL don't know. So the XFL was a football league that Vince McMahon uh, decided to start in the year 2000. Vince McMahon of the WWE. That is the Vince McMahon, uh, the wrestler. Yeah. Entrepreneur. He does a millionaire. He's awesome. Yeah, he's interesting. Wrestlepreneur. Um, so they they advertise this sport as football with an edge. Oh, extreme mm, football. Extreme league. football. You know, so you, you're expecting a linebacker running with a chair, with a chair. to take out the quarterback. <laughs> you know what I mean? A guy running for a touchdown and some dude jumps out of the stands and clotheslines him. However, that was not what happened. He hate me. It just turned out to be football. Pretty w- much. With... Uh, Lackluster players, people who can't make the NFL. Yeah, and they just didn't have the uh, the push behind it, the corporate push from all the networks and stuff. So it only lasted one year. It wasn't as nuts as it was. It wasn't made out. To it be. wasn't at all. It was just football. It was just football. With it was just inferior football. players. Yeah, it was kind of like the <laughs> the college players that couldn't didn't get drafted. Yeah, is who who it was. Um, but now Vince McMahon says it's something different, oh. and this is good football. And that they've uh, instated all these rules that are different yeah. so they can actually grab talent. Mm-hmm. And uh, they have a whole bunch of different network supports. So all the games will be televised and all that kind of thing. And I think it's going to go swimmingly. Ken Zen has high hopes. I do. I do. And I, I like pretty much anything uh, sports related that starts with an X. Do you? It just adds excitement. It I don't does. Know, X seems right? very edgy. Edgy, it is. Like, it really is. Yeah. So, Ken has so far chosen the Dallas Renegades mm-hmm. because they have a quarterback whose name we know, Landry Jones. Not yeah. only that, he was Ben Roethlisberger's backup. He was a steal. I've seen him play. I've chosen for my team the St. Louis Battlehawks. I like. I like the. I like the name Battlehawks. Battlehawks. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I've chosen them for a very political reason. So the St. Louis Battlehawks are located, obviously, in St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah, I would think so. And St. Louis just lost their NFL team, the St. Louis Rams, which moved to Los Angeles. And were moved by a billionaire called Stan Kroenke, Mm -hmm. who owns the now Los Angeles Rams and also happens to own Arsenal Football Club part of his sports portfolio of investments mm. not teams yes. that he wants to win no. investments right. and arsenal has steadily declined in prominence and on-field success since what we call silent stan took over the club mm. and he railroaded the people of st louis and took their team away to put it in los angeles where there was more money He's taking money out of Arsenal to build his billion-dollar stadium for the L.A. Rams. Mm -hmm. And our team is falling apart under his ownership. So the people of St. Louis hate Stan Kroenke. The fans of Arsenal Football Club also hate Stan Kroenke. So we have a kinship. And therefore, I support the St. Louis Battlehawks. Well, I I wish you the best in your (laughs) battlehawking. However, (laughs) week one... I do not wish you anything. We play each other in week one. It turns out that we play each other. (laughs) So that's fantastic. (laughs) So we'll we'll see. Do you think that perhaps in the future, when that scenario comes up again, you can say, you've been cronkied. You've been cronkied. You know what I mean? Like, I've taken the life right out of you just for my own capitalist 
you know, things. You've been cronkied. Silent so? Stan. First of all, he's got the worst toupee of all time. A guy with that much money should be able to get like a nice weave going. Sure. It's terrible. <laughs> and a mustache. It's bad news. <laughs> I think he owns Walmart. I think that's the really? deal. Yeah. So oh, we just geez. we just bought a bunch of oh, stuff from him. We got cronkied. We got cronkied. Oh, dang. And that money's not going into Arsenal. It's going no, into the LA Rams. That's... And uh, well, thanks for the chunky soup. So Arsenal's having the worst season in 40 years. It's a disaster. They had to fire the coach. They got a new guy. Yada, yada, yada. All sorts of upheaval happening at this dude's club. He has said not one word. Wow. Nothing. It's wild. Well, that's got to be frustrating for you. Dude doesn't care, yeah. man. Because like I said, I'm a Steelers fan and that's a family run business. Right. And it's been forever. Right. So the Roonies have run it, you know, and at the end of the year, I just watched uh, last week uh, the Rooney speech for the season and yeah. what he wants to do improve. And he's hands on and loves football. And loves the team. Loves the team. He is the team. They are the team. It's a family. Right. It's a family. Yeah. Arsenal used to be a family. Yeah. Now they're owned by an American who wants the money. And that happened at Liverpool. The Gillettes were an American family that owned Liverpool for a while. Uh, like 10 or 20 years ago, and Liverpool fell apart. American ownership of European soccer teams is generally a recipe for disaster. It makes sense. The, I mean, how many World Cups has America won? Right. You know, they didn't even make it into the tournament last time. Right. So, yeah, that's unfortunate. It, it Soccer is a different culture. Football is a different culture than North American sports. It's like a, it's like a Jamaican owning a bobsledding team. Right. It makes no sense. All they get is a movie out of that. That's it. So the good people of Liverpool hounded the Gillettes out. The, oh, wow. the protest was so aggressive and vociferous <laughs> that eventually they sold the team, as wow, far as I understand. Of the backlash. It. Yeah. And what happened huh. is last year Liverpool won the Champions League, right. and this year they will win the Premier League. They're so far ahead already. Wow. They're, they, and they may even go undefeated. And only wow. one other team has gone undefeated in the Premier League, which was Arsenal. Oh. The Invincibles, Arsenal, Thierry Henry, Dennis Bergkamp. Oh. So we're desperate for somebody to beat Liverpool. But the point is, once those American owners were out of the picture... Yeah, it makes sense. It does make sense. Um, you know, making money is great, but capitalism and ownership of sports teams doesn't, doesn't make sense. It's a different thing. Because it, that's not the way teamworks works. In North America, yeah. they are franchises. Yeah. They are, right? Yeah. European football teams are not that. Well, I think any person has, has to respect their owner, for lack of a better term. Yeah. And maybe in these corporate situations, you just don't, because you know, may not even meet the person. Yeah. So how do you respect them? Yeah, I don't know. You know, whereas... The other guys, they're on the field. They're there. Yeah. Like, even though I hate the Patriots, Robert Kraft is always involved. Right. Like, he's there. He cares about it. Right. And uh, it makes a difference, man. Respect. Ars Arsenal played in a massive European final last year. I listened to it driving out west on tour in the car, and they lost. But the point is, they were in a European final, and the owner didn't even go to the right. game. That's, in that's insane. Right? Yeah. Mm. Sad. Mm -hmm. So St. Louis Battlehawks, anti crunky Okay. Okay. I like it. I like it. And, uh, well, you know, if you got a renegade against a Battlehawk, renegade's going to kick some ass. Well, no one's no quite doubt. sure what a Battlehawk does. I don't even know what a <laughs> renegade is, <laughs> but that's okay. I, I think you are a bit of a renegade. Well, maybe that's my problem. You don't have to live like a refugee, but... <laughs> The only reason I said that is because it starts with R and it has three syllables. <laughs> yeah, well, and also everybody loves Tom Petty, which is great. I do. Mark Marin does a funny bit about that on his most recent special about how Tom Petty can bring us all together. Absolutely. You know, Republicans, Democrats, we all love Petty. Everybody can we agree loves, on that at least? Yeah, Gainesville, Florida. Yeah. We're in Texas right now. Yes, we are. I've seen Trump hats. I saw my very first Trump 2020 yesterday. Eek. And I survived the experience. You did. Somehow. You did. And uh, probably because I kept my mouth shut. 
which was nice. I think that's right. She was a 90 year old lady, but I really wanted to tell her. She was probably packing. <laughs> she was. <laughs> She was full of anger. There was no question. Yeah. 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 It's real, folks. She was walking around like an old lady without a bag of prune juice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and she wanted one. She and, sure did. And Donald Trump is going to get her one. Yeah. Going to drain that swamp, dehydrate that shit, and put it into a fruit. Get prune mm -hmm. juice for everyone. <laughs> everyone. It's weird, isn't it? It's very strange. I've seen, I saw, strange some here mag I saw some magnificent hats on the way down here. Like, Keep America Great, that was a Trump hat. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was one about Jesus. Yeah, guns and... Guns and Jesus. Guns and Jeebus and all that kind of stuff. Texas is a compelling place. That's the place. South. But in fact, it wasn't even in Texas that I saw those things. It was in, like, Indiana or someplace. Right, yeah. It was on... It was, well, it was in the belt. It was in the belt. It was in the belt, for the, sure. The belt is big on Jesus and guns. That's right. And that's also... We met the quickest draw in the South. We did! This man, he had to show us how quick his draw was Yeah, because he's been goo -goo gooing for a while. Yeah, he's and good. It was so fast, I didn't even see it. Nope. And he wanted to show me again. I had to get out of there. So this dude's like, A, he played a surreal math game with, it's just a dude at a department store. like at a security. Truck stop. He was the security guy? He was the security guy? of, of the, uh, the stop. I felt yeah. very secure with that guy. Yeah, he, was, he was watching everybody make sure they had their rear seats and they had their merchandise inside their bags. And so he's part security, part magician. <laughs> and uh, so he did this weird math game with us that we messed up. And, and I don't care because I was never any good at math. <laughs> Ken the Zen should yeah. feel some shame. I though. was very frustrated. I got duped. You got duped in a math game. I did. And the reason why I did was because I was cocky. Were you? And I know every time I get cocky, I lose. Interesting. So it was it was my bad. And next time I see that guy, I'm going to tell him how things add up. Oh, we'll see. And then he he pulled us. We were trying to leave. We are trying so hard to leave. <laughs> and he calls us back over and he's like, did I ever tell you I'm the whatever, I'm the quickest draw? <laughs> Yeah, with his hands, like he's going for his holster. Yeah, you know, like, quickest draw around. He's yeah. like, you want me to prove it? He's like, yeah, okay, go for it. You want to see it again? <laughs> oh. I am going to steal that joke, though. Oh, I've you used no that. Idea. I've used a variation of that <laughs> oh, joke. Like, okay. I believe my joke was, which, of course, I stole from somebody else, was sure. you want to see the fastest backflip in the world. Okay, yeah, yeah. Want to see it again? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Fool me once. <laughs> Fool me Shame once. On. You can't, you can't get fooled uh, again. Oh, can't, can't get fooled again. <laughs> they used that clip. They used one the, of my favorite things. They ever. used that clip on WGR radio all the time. I use, I listen to WGR, which is Buffalo Sports Radio, which is why I'm kind of a Bills fan now. But they ain't turned me on to the Sabers. Go Habs, go. And uh, I listen to Mike Shope and the Bulldog, the sports, the afternoon guys on the. And it's great. They have a great job. They talk about sports. I would love to talk about sports all day. That's their That'd be job. Fun. We should probably start just a sports podcast. I, I mean, there's a, there's a million of them, but there is. You and I can do it. But there's a million sports fans. Yes, there are millions. And uh, so, the, in part of the intro to the show, they run they run that clip all the time. Oh, that's so funny. I could I I, I could use that as intro music to like a band situation at some time. <laughs> so, so. Oh yeah. I think the Who should use it actually. Yeah. And then go into, obviously. Won't get fooled again. You know. We did have intro right. music for one show, didn't we? Yeah. the uh, So John and I play in a band called The Three. And if I'm in a situation or we're in a situation where we have a, a full PA set up and somebody working the sound instead right. of us doing the sound, right. then I, I do have intro music for, for us, which is which is awesome. Unfortunately, we've only got to do it twice. We've got to use it twice. Was it twice? Once in London. Mm-hmm. And then once in Port Stanley. Right. I remember the Port Stanley one, but I don't yeah. remember. I couldn't hear the music. Yeah, the Norma Jeans. They screwed it big. up, didn't they? No. No? No, it was good. Really? Yeah, everything was good. Uh, the rest of our gig at Port Stanley kind of got screwed up. Did it? Not so much on ours. The We had some technical difficulties with uh, production, but... We were opening for this really freaking arrogant, lousy band, and I never criticize anybody. <laughs> I know. But this, lot of egos. this awful band called Sarah Smith Band, <laughs> and they were a nightmare to try to work with. And I think they probably sabotaged it. I think that did happen, actually. 
<laughs> I was not playing that show, so I'm allowed to say so. It was fun. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. For sure. Hiroshima Hearts had cool intro music. I'd never heard Hiroshima Hearts we, intro music. Two things. A, we had, uh, when we recorded something at Sugar Shack, we just like had Tyler go in and just lay down some yeah. blues licks. Yeah. The guitar player. Yeah, okay. Just some straight up casual blues, which we called porch music. And it's like four... The concept was a dude sitting on his porch playing blues guitar. Gotcha. The Robert Johnson kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. So Tyler did that. We called it porch music. And as we were a very bluesy, heavy rock band, yeah. a few times we had the luxury of playing our intro music. Like at London Music Hall, we got to use it. Right. We opened, it's all yeah, situational, right? We opened for Nazareth and like the lights drop yeah. and the porch music comes on. We're like, this is rad. Personally, I think intro music is super important. Of course. Uh, my band, oh, my first real band, Tommy Rot, we had intro music mm -hmm. uh, in a very similar fashion. We recorded our first CD and we went in and just started doing some neat, um, you know, like trippy synthesizer type things that we used then. And then the joys, we had intro music and... Um, Sarah, we don't have intro music, but the three, we have intro music. So I think it's really important. I think it really gives the band a second to get in the band situation. It announces you guys a are show together. too. Like it sets up a show. And it sets up a show for sure. So, and what you're going to bring, hopefully. Yeah. Like I, I believe the intro music for the three is, is pretty funny. I and forget I, what it is. And I think- I only I think, heard it twice. I think we're pretty funny. Yeah. You know, we're entertaining. So, so what it is, it's a, a Ravi Shankar. All right playing his sitar so he's making all these sitar sounds and then uh, you know he stops everybody cheers and he's like well if you like that you'll love this if you like the sound of the tuning i hope you enjoy the show <laughs> <laughs> and then we then we then come we, on then with, we play and we except, I, except i couldn't hear the intro music right, and i yeah, didn't know what was gonna happen uh, right yeah the first time i wanted to surprise these guys and you did because i was hoping just to get some laughs right and that's the whole thing and and uh, just to build a you know a team team thing everybody laughing yeah. and and kind of like okay you release that <laughs> and now you play your now show you play you know so the other bit of intro we had which i'm very proud of when we released our seven inch vinyl single reach out we did the release show at aeolian hall yeah. and we sold it hard and we had probably 250 people in the place which is almost capacity at aeolian it was very proud of us and my idea for the show was it was kind of a retrospective on the whole band at that point, and we were dropping this single. I thought, let's have voiceover intro. So the house lights drop, and what you hear is the band talking. And so we went into the studio at CHRW, and we got Howie to basically interview us, moderate this discussion of us talking about the band. And so you had like oh, a like a two or three minute intro of just our voices over the PA yeah. talking about the band and laughing. Oh, and there was like a it. there was a really great moment. I forget the final moment that we chose, but Mike said something horrendously pretentious. Yeah. Just so pretentious. Sure. And there was like a two second silence and then the whole <laughs> band burst out laughing at what Mike had just said. <laughs> And it was a perfect moment to yeah. just encapsulate this band you're about to see, and then light light up and right. into the first song. Killer! It I was love it. it was awesome. I, I was really it. really pleased I, with it. I do love that. It's important. It's part of a show. I think I think it is part of the show. That's why a lot of, I mean, a lot of shows sometimes you don't have music. You might have an MC, yeah. something prepared, but I I think it really sets up both the band and the audience to be like, okay, the show is about to begin. Prepare, yeah. prepare, and it, it's whatever that means for you. It sets like um, a tone, like Steel Panther, the best. Steel Panther, when you go into their show, so they're running music before the show, and it's all hair metal for the most part, except every time I've gone to a Steel Panther show, they played a King's X song as part of their pre-show intro, which I, makes me tingle. Yeah. And so you're just standing around, talking to people, whatever. You can feel the energy, but the lights are up and whatever, and they're just playing music. Then the house lights drop, and everybody, you know that moment oh, when yeah. the house lights drop? I love it. And everybody loses their that. mind? Heck yeah. 
And then they played, the first couple times I saw them, they played a song called Blackout in the Red Room by Love Hate, which is just a banging rock song from a banging rock record that <laughs> that got lost in the shuffle. It came out like 93, just as metal was dying. Love Hate released a killer record called Blackout in the Red Room, which you would really like. You should check it out. Yeah. It's a very Guns N' Roses kind of record. Cool. And it's just like a sleazy rock record. We'll Spotify that for sure. It's yeah. it's a great cool. rock record, and uh, and that was their intro music. The house lights drop, and they would play that whole song. It's like three and a half minutes. Blackout in the red room, and the, the place goes nuts. And it's a total homage to the rock scene from the eighties, sure. early nineties, and then Steel Panther comes out. And and just lights they it up. Thing. They have this panther sound, <laughs> which is the start of their song "Eyes sure. of a Panther," <laughs> and the lights go up, and it's just like, and then just chaos happens after that. But it's it's set up by that song. And then the last time I saw them, it was a Van Halen song, one of the old like seventies Van Halen mm-hmm. tunes. I forget which one. Unchained, maybe. House lights drop. The same. House lights drop, and they play a whole song, and the audience oh, is just really losing it by the time it's over. And then yeah. they come out and do their thing. Even Hitler, I think, used to have like intro of some sort. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, sure. It's I part of the what, show. I wonder what that music was. I don't think it was music. I heard a thing one time where it was like Hitler would they would play like white noise through the through the whole speaker oh. system, and it would drive everybody insane. And so that when they finally shut that off and he spoke, everybody would be so happy. <laughs> yeah. But interesting. to be interesting fair, concept. there was also all those people were at gunpoint. So eh, right. I, I'm mm-hmm. not sure. I'm not sure. But So talking about band intro music, one of my favorite ever was at a show and uh, it was Motley Crue. Oh, really? Okay. So, you know, the lights are down and, and I, usually it's music, usually, you know, or an audio clip or something like you were mentioning. But this time it was just like the motorcycle, and it's just motorcycle noise, motorcycle noise, motorcycle noise for like three minutes, and then all of a sudden each of them ride out onto the on stage on a motorcycle, on a Harley, get off, and of course, get off. girls, 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 of course, there it was, and it was just like this is kick ass. That's a show. This the worst ish uh, that I can remember was I went to an Alice Cooper show, and it was just an Alice Cooper only show, so I was there about an hour before he came on. So they just kept on playing music, and it was all Alice Cooper music. Oh, weird. Which I hated because every song that I played, I knew they wouldn't play in a uh, show. Oh, right. You know, well, I suspected. I didn't right. know. But, and of course, I was right. But so a song would come on, I'm like, ah, oh, shoot. Dang, you know, I'm not going to hear this one. And so I, I didn't like that ploy too much. But Does Alice play the whole back catalog when he does live shows? Or yeah, he goes, he goes all the way, not the whole thing, but all the way from 71 Right up. Yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't do a new show every night because he has a show show. Of course. But, um, but every tour, he, he sw- same with Paul McCartney, switches in and out the old stuff because there's so much material. That's the thing. Like, it's got to be very hard to decide. For sure. Especially, Especially if you're promoting new If stuff, you're on a new right? album, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Which Alice Cooper is on, you know. But <clears throat> usually he plays one song off the new album. Oh, just and then one. That, that's about it, usually. Interesting. People like the uh, the classics. They're like, well, it's so hard to say because, you know, when your career starts in 1967, yeah, what is classic? Right. Right? Is Raise Your Fist and Yell classic? Some because people, that's halfway through your career. Some people would you probably know? say no. Like, there are probably yeah. Alice Cooper purists who are like, no, yeah. man, just the 70s. Right. So, for Alice Cooper, he had the Alice Cooper band, yeah, which we've talked about. But from 67 to 74, you know, that was one band. So, I suppose that would be the classics. And then everything after that was Alice Cooper and then hired guns, for lack of a better term. Right. Yeah, yeah I don't know. It's got to be very difficult. Yeah. If yeah, we... I'm sure he put some thought into it. You know, like last tour I saw, he played a song uh, from the Constrictor album. Really? Which I never thought, The World Needs Guts. Hmm. And I, n- I never thought I would ever hear that song. And they started playing as this bitching, like, finger tapping. Yeah. Nita Strauss. Nita, just killing it. ass. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was in my chair going to fucking rocking it was awesome it was you, so good you were I, in uh, your chair well no well maybe i was sitting down from the beer who knows 
Oh, Ken the I wasn't. I wasn't in my chair. I'm, that's just a, a, a phrase. I've seen photos from the last couple of King's X tours where they actually played a few rooms that people sit. Right, like yeah. little theaters where they sit and watch. Yeah, that's a, that's a weird vibe. It doesn't make sense to that's me. A weird, that's like going to a rock concert in London. It's extremely rare that people are standing in the concerts I've gone to at the hockey arena. Oh, really? Which is ridiculous. Like even Metallica. We, I had ushers come and be like, you have to sit down, sir. Oh, like, man. This is Metallica fucking show. What are you yeah. talking about? The people behind you can't see. Well, tell them to stand up. Tell them to stand well, up. You, just a rock show. There was like a... That's, that was London, though. There, unfortunately. Well, it's not just London. There was almost a riot at the ghost show I went to in Toronto. Wow. At the Sony Center. And I sat way up in the balcony because that's the only seats I could get. Yeah. And I will confess, I sat through the show. Mm-hmm. But people... And I was right up front of the balcony. There were people behind me who were standing... And people behind them were yelling at them to sit down. Right, absolutely. But I feel like there's a different etiquette in the balcony for some reason. Well, in you know, in hockey arenas, when you're up that high, sometimes it's uncomfortable to stand. Well, you could fall. It feels like you, you could know, fall over. It feels over. like you're going to, especially the old Maple Leaf Garden was terrible. It's like for straight that. down yeah, to the yeah, ice. I, that's where I saw Prolgen the first time. Yeah. And I was right against, my wall was against the back. Uh, your back, oh, was, my against back was against the wall. my back was against the wall. Yeah. And uh, that was, eek. But, you know. How are those seats for a show? I think once the lights go out and you're in it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. For me, it doesn't. Like, honestly, it's all about the music. Yeah, it should be. You mostly, you know. So as long as, as, long as the sound is, is good, I don't, it doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, I remember another riot breaking out almost at a, at a soccer match in Toronto. I went to see Toronto FC play a friendly against Liverpool. I shouldn't do that. I should stop, I should stop doing should that. Better. I should. But, uh, I mean, the, the tradition in Canada is you watch a football match and you sit in your seat and watch the game, whereas the tradition everywhere else is you stand during the game, right? right? yeah. So Liverpool's playing, and there's a bunch of real football fans mm-hmm. from England at the game standing to watch the game because it's a game. Right. And a war broke out, and the security had to come to get these people to sit mm-hmm. down, and this one guy would not... Right. And it was like, oh man. I wonder what the situation. Like, I wonder if you're supposed to sit down. Like, I I don't know what the, the etiquette is or what the rules maybe even are. I don't even know. I, know I just never do. You know, back when I smoked cigarettes, right? I didn't give a shit that there was no smoking. If I wanted to smoke, I smoked. Yeah. So I wonder if it's kind of similar. I I don't know. I feel like I'm not sure uh, that the tradition is 100 percent to stand in Europe. I'm wondering if that comes from days when there weren't seats. <laughs> yeah, right totally totally i don't know i know the nfl games i've gone to when i've been fortunate enough to be down by the field it was you know everybody would be sitting and then the quarterback would hunt the ball and throw it and then everybody would stand oh really right so you had to stand or you mm. wouldn't see, or you wouldn't see the on. game yeah and it was like that every play like oh up down up down so but like I, being in church yeah it was you know and then in hockey it was you pretty much sit unless you know, and something scoring, happens and, you know, and then everybody happening. jumps up yeah. So I don't really, I don't know. I like to sit and watch the game. Increasingly, I like to sit and watch the show, too. Right, yeah. I'm getting older. <laughs> I'm getting older. I'm getting older. I understand. You know? I'm, for me, I'm kind of like that right in between. It's like I'm sitting down, the show starts, nobody's standing, right? I'm, I'm up in the you know nosebleeds, and I'm just like thinking to myself, I hope this guy in front of me stands. Just please stand, please stand, yeah, please stand. And really? then they stand. I'm like, yeah, I'm up. And then, you know, behind me, hey, fuck it, sit down. Yeah. Like, everybody's standing. Yeah. You know, but uh, if they're uh, not standing, I don't have that excuse. I'm not at the show to get in a fight with people. I'm at the show to watch the show. This is what we talked about er- earlier yeah. today about me being in the quote unquote pit at the Queens of the Stone Age yeah. show. It's like, I don't, I don't want to have to look over my shoulder. I want to watch the That's show. Right. Yeah. I want to take the show in. It's hard to do. Dude, we've done an hour. Just like that. Eh? Just like that. Time flies. Time flies when you're in Texas. This is like, it seemed like only one thirtieth of our trip here. <laughs> that was a long ride. That was a long drive. I think it was more than 30 hours, actually, but I don't know. My uh, my legs were sore from riding in the van. Yeah, it's getting old. I'm getting old, I should say. We drove, tough. we drove London to just outside of Indianapolis the first day, right? Yeah, south of Indianapolis. South of Indianapolis. Like, a, we were actually in Illinois by the time we... Stop. Just outside Marion, I believe. Yeah. You know where that is, everybody. Yeah. Marion. Indian. Uh, it was Illinois. Yeah. 
Illinois. Well, we stopped in Mount Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon Illinois, right. which is right at the southern tip. Yeah. And then the next day we drove to outside of Houston. Yep. Yeah. Yes, we did. Yeah, just north of Houston. Just north of Houston. Was it north of Houston? Yeah, because we drove through Houston in the daytime. And I took a wonderful photograph because King's X was based on You really did. That was a great photo. Yeah, I, I, I did a little cropping, but it worked out. It's on my Instagram. You can find it there. Where is that? JW underscore Huff. Oh, gosh. Okay. I haven't done a separate Instagram account for the podcast. I'm still debating that. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I, well, I don't. You should. Maybe. Why not? Yeah. Or why? I don't even know. I don't know. I have no answers. Uh, Only questions. That, so those were two like like 12, 14 hour days. It, like in the old days, and I reckon on the way home, we'll probably drive two days instead of three days. Oh, man. Um, which it's those are long days. Those are like fourteen hour days. days for for hour myself, days. I'm ten hours is kind of like I'm ready yeah. to to get out of this tube. Oh yeah, you know? absolutely. And then we only had like seven hours the last day. And some people are like seven hours. Oh man, but it's like sure. it That's becomes awesome. it becomes a breeze. Yeah, it was a breeze. Yeah, totally. Now we're down here in Texas, and it's all good. I love it. I love it. Beautiful weather. Very nice weather. And the people are really nice. People are lovely, even in their Trump hats. Even even in the Trump hats, they're, I reckon they're good folks underneath all that. I've had sure. some magnificent hotel waffles. In the shape of what state? In the shape of Texas. That's they amazing. have a waffle iron that is the shape of Texas. The best damn waffle iron in Texas. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We had a, John made me a, a Texan waffle I this did. morning. While you were waiting so to you. get Pearl Jam tickets. While I was Pearl Jamming out, it was a... Uh, Exhilarating. I probably had a buzz for about an hour afterwards. I was oh, just like, oh, there's a lot of carbs and sugar happening there. Well, not from that. From the we were flying gym. on the. Well, well maybe it's, it was a, that. it's a quest. It could have been the syrup. I don't eat much yeah, sugar. I think you would have been buzzing any. Well, maybe, but. Yeah, I don't know. Getting tickets online is like going to battle, like a St. Louis oh, battle hawk. I really miss the days where I could just stand in line overnight and just get my tickets. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like that was great. You know, the, the people that wanted them got them. The technology always <laughs> falls apart. Like it's oh, like, yeah. uh, I know. I know. Who goes to a hotel? Like, why is Wi-Fi always going in and out at hotels? I, they don't try. You hard. know, it's a, honestly, it's about eighty-five percent ratio. I would say they do not try hard at hotels, but it's better than the Wi-Fi in, in East German hotels. Oh yeah, they don't even have. <laughs> they don't even have Wi-Fi. They get Wi-Fi in VLAN. Wi-Fi. <laughs> Vilan, yeah, man. Yeah. All right, we're starting to ramble, dude. Let's wrap right, this thing. Let's wrap it. Um, by the time we do another one, I don't think the XFL will have started yet, but hopefully we'll get to do a road episode following the St. Louis Battlehawks Dallas Renegades. Yeah, game. for sure, for sure. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure we will do another road episode and, and talk about what we're doing here on the road. Absolutely. You should. Uh, we should do uh, Super Bowl predictions right now. Kansas oh, City gosh. versus uh, San Francisco. My instinct says San Francisco. Um, but I would prefer Kansas City to win just because I don't want, I do not want San Francisco to get their sixth Super Bowl. You're defending I Pittsburgh. Want, yeah, that's how many Pittsburgh have, and I don't, I don't want that. Um, that being said, they look real good. They look real good. Kansas City's great too, but I don't know. San Fran's got it, I think, this year. He's saying San Fran. I'm going to say Chiefs. I'm going oh. KC. Every battle hawk would disagree that's with me. That's right. Patrick yeah. Mahomes. Yeah, he's good. I'm gonna yeah, say Tyreek Hill. I'm gonna say yeah, Chiefs in a in a high scoring match like 37, 27, something like that. So the yeah, they're both great offenses. Yeah, but I think that San Francisco has a better defense. Yeah, they usually only give up about forty points. <laughs> <laughs> it could be lights out. It could be a really entertaining football. I think game. I'm hoping for the best, and uh, we're gonna be down here in Texas, which is all football all the time. And we're gonna be playing a Super Bowl party. And we're playing a Super Bowl party, and. Uh, Gosh darn it, it's going to be great. I've never had the experience of a Super Bowl with, well, I have, I guess, at a resort maybe one time, playoff games anyway, mm -hmm. but never the Super Bowl in America with American fans. Right, for sure. That should and, be. And Texans, the football is Texans, king. Texans. In football, in Texas. I'm, I was in Europe during the European soccer championships at one point, 2008. Right. That was compelling, but I think this will be a real experience. I hope I hope it's a great time right. for sure. Well, we'll come back and we'll tell you all about it. Go Battlehawks! Yeah, that's right. Go Renegades! That's right. What was that Renegade song? 
that's the one. That that's the one. About. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. I, I've played that song a couple times. And wasn't there been, a newer one? Oh, Vance Joy or somebody. Oh, I don't know much about new stuff. Me neither. But didn't we have guy. to play it with Moon Dog? Something about no. a renegade. I don't think so. No, I have to look. But into I that. did have to learn Renegade Sticks for a, a, a couple of '70s bands I've played with. There you go. Now and then, go Sticks, go Todd Zuckerman. Yeah. Heck yeah! Say goodbye, Ken the Zen. Goodbye, Ken the Zen. Goodbye, Ken the Zen. We'll catch you on the next one. <laughs>